Oh my goodness, it is my huge pleasure and huge honor to welcome Henry Jenkins, Provost Professor of Communications, Journalism, Cinematic Arts, and Education at USC. Welcome, Henry. Thanks, happy to be here. I often say it's just Professor of Miscellaneous Studies and it solves that problem of too many things. <laughs> yes, the long, the long list that is well-deserved long list, Henry. What's your origin story when it comes to comics, comic studies? Well, comics goes all the way back to childhood. I mean, I am a creature of the 60s. Uh, one of my first fandoms is probably Batman 66, uh, which I was passionate about. Uh, I think my father coaxed me to read because he would look at the newspaper and say, looks like Batman died today in that horrible snow chrome accident. And I would be so gullible that I fell for it week after week. And I finally started reading the paper to, to make sure that Batman hadn't died. So I re grew up reading Karl Barks and, you know, the, the vintage 60s superheroes, mostly DC at that point. Uh, put it away a bit when I was in grad school until students kept saying, you've got to see this. It, it's Watchmen. You've got to see this. It's Dark Knight. It's, you know, they were killing joke. There were so many things coming out in that period that I started reading comics again and never left. And I guess I'm, I was even trying to think this morning, what was the first piece I actually published on comics? Because I've written essays on comics often on through the years, often in contexts that would not have been considered comic studies, but would have been a media study niche that I pulled toward writing about, about comics. But gradually I found my way into the clubhouse of comic scholars. I've always been someone who wanted to write about an emerging topic in media and I wrote early on about television studies and I was early to the table on uh, game studies and now comic studies is where my passion is. It's not like I've ever written exclusively about any given media, but comics is whenever I get a chance to write about comics, that's what I'm most eager to write about right now. Well, yes, you've done so much, Henry, uh, in terms of media, transmedia. Can, if you were to take a step back and look at Henry Jenkins, what would you say is your uh, vision, your approach to all of this? Well, the word we used at MIT, when I was back at MIT is comparative media studies. And I think that sums it up fairly well, or at least the side, size of my work could be summed up by as comparative media studies. I mean, my, my dissertation years ago was on vaudeville and film comedy. So even as a graduate student, I was interested in that intersection between media and what happens when something crosses from one media platform to another. I arrived at MIT in the midst of the digital revolution and it was situated in a literature department. So more layers of comparison got layered into that. I discovered television studies in graduate school, so that was part of the mix. And gradually at MIT, I really worked through this idea of how do we think across media? How do we th think comparatively across different media platforms and their affordances? How do we break out of medium specificity toward a more transmedia perspective? How do we think across time, the history of media and the way certain patterns emerge over time? How do we think across national borders? Although I remain mostly an Americanist, I'm very attentive through my blog with scholars around the world who are doing parallel projects. And I'm eager to pull those into the work that I do. Uh, and it's a, and increasingly while I was at MIT, that blurring of the lines between theory and practice, both in terms of helping motivate media makers to think in theoretical, terms, but also how do we take ideas out of the academy and engage in dialogue with other people who are involved with media, media change. So put all that together and that really is comparative media studies. So if we think about comics and stuff, my latest work, it's mostly about comics, but it involves dialogues with a number of other media from, you know, film, to something like cabinets of curiosity, uh, which are turn out to be very important for thinking about the work of, of um, Brian Talbot or scrapbooks, 
which I'd argue are increasingly important for thinking about the visual style of a number of graphic women working in comics today. So those comparisons remain really vital, even in a book like Comics and Stuff, which has comics in its title and is very much focused on that medium as its central consideration. In fact, you're sort of a one-stop shop, right, for comparative media studies, a kind of maybe, you know, maybe I could go so far as to say, a, a maybe a department kind of unto yourself. <laughs> um, why, you kind of explained this already, but maybe why, why research, write and teach media, transmedia, comics? Um, what, you know, when someone asks you that who's not an academic, what, do you, what would you say, Henry? Well, I start by the fact that I study what I'm passionate about, and my passions lead inevitably onward to new media because we live in an extraordinary moment in time. I would argue one of the great moments of media transition throughout human history, if we think about the transition from morality to literacy, the rise of the printing press, the rise of modern mass media, and this digital moment. And that's created churn across every media sector. And in turn, media change is impacting every aspect of society. So is it, it's impacting business. It's impacting education. It's impacting politics and activism. And my work has taken me to all of those different sectors to think about what media change looks like at the current moment. Uh, and so... That's one answer. The other is this is the vernacular that young people today in particular are doing all of those things. So the work we've been doing lately on popular culture and the civic imagination grew out of the fact that young people around the world are using pop culture stories to express their political identities, to identify what a better world looks like, uh, to talk about models of change, and in many of them are using superheroes in that regard. So my team has done several pieces now looking at superhero metaphors that run through politics. So for example, the dreamer movement for immigrant rights has been really thinking hard about Superman. They would argue there are no illegal aliens, there are only undocumented people. But if there were an illegal alien, it might be Kal-El from the planet Krypton whose parents send him away in search of a better world and a better life someplace else, who crosses the border in the middle of the night, uh, lands in a cornfield in Kansas, is adopted by an Anglo couple that teaches him to hide who he is and where he came from. He was raised an American, but has no American papers or documents as far as we know, and eventually goes out and fights for truth, justice in the American way wearing his ethnic garb, that is the costume is made from the, the blankets his mother wrapped him in when she sent him away from the dying Krypton. So put all that together and you have a story that can explain from one group of young people to another what it is to be undocumented in the United States today and why these young people feel totally American even though technically they weren't born here and don't possess the papers that that sort of automatically grant them US citizenship. So what we're seeing is that pop culture is the vernacular young people around the world are using to think about political change. And that's preoccupied me a lot in some of the recent work that my research group has been doing. Gosh, thank you, Henry. I know I've heard, of course, the analogy made between um, you know, Superman and, or Kal-El and um, undocumented folks. But yeah, thank you for putting that in such a beautifully sort of articulated way. Um, and of course the su super heroic actions and deeds, and yet we're still never, um, those members of our family who are undocumented never really considered a part of, right, the US. Um, convergence culture, wow, this really kind of, I mean, I, I, this is, Everybody knows this book, I think, right? At least um, um, the, um, everybody that I bump into. And it's, tell me, I guess a way to ask this question, how does it complicate and build on your earlier concept of transmedia storytelling? Well, I've been thinking, I was thinking this morning about historically which of them actually comes first. Um, I think, I don't use the term convergence culture myself much anymore. Mm 
at the time I was writing that book, convergence was a buzzword among the tech sector. And I was getting frustrated because it was very clear that the technology was not yet speaking to each other in a dominant, you know, in a, in a kind of easy way. There's a rant at the beginning of the book, maybe the most embarrassing passage in the book, is me complaining about wanting just a phone that only is a phone. And obviously this is a pre-iPhone moment where the iPhone really conquered a lot of the complaints I had about integrating all these media functions through a shared device. But so the term convergence culture for me was an overarching term that was meant to describe that convergence is not yet successful technically, but is emerging culturally. And at the center of it was that second phrase where old and new media collide. So I was really in that part that frame interested in that intersection of old media, which was increasingly concentrated, and new media, which was increasingly participatory and more open to more people to create and share with each other. And that friction was something that led me to write that book. Now, in writing that book, I had written a bit about transmedia storytelling before. I always saw that as a subset of convergence. Uh, in some ways, that's the concept out of the book that has had the most play, and now there are books on transmedia studies and so forth. So, and as it got more play, I think more people absorb transmedia to describe pretty much everything else in convergence culture, right? So today I would say transmedia by itself is an adjective which requires something to modify. And that could be storytelling, it could be performance, Marsha, Kinder, who coined the term transmedia, um, was talking about characters. So I've got a piece I'm doing now on exit stage left, at, which is really using that to think about Snagglepuss as a transmedia character who appeared in many media platforms, but ha suffers amnesia in that he doesn't remember where he's been and where he's come from or where he's going, right? So he he may exit stage left, but we don't know where that leads to because the next episode begins with him in another vacuum and there's no sense of connection across them. So I would say transmedia characters, are, which are what Kendra wrote about as entertainment super systems, are different from transmedia stories where there's a stronger set of connections across it. And today we're hearing about transmedia activism by Sasha Kasanza Chalk. We're hearing about transmedia documentary. So it, seemingly the word transmedia has absorbed all of the ideas that connect different media platforms together and has become a kind of confusing soup. It also connects now trans text, connects together fan fiction with canonical works, which I had been struck when I wrote about transmedia the first time that we were seeing canonical texts doing things that fan fiction had been doing filling in backstory, connecting characters, focusing on secondary characters, exploring the world more deeply. And so I had used the term transmedia to separate out when it's done by the producers from when it's done by fans. I'm now persuaded that in a world where fan stuff is as visible as it is, when we talk about the transmedia trajectory of a particular story world, Fan creativity is part of that, right? It's very hard to separate out Harry Potter fan fiction from Harry Potter, right? So they're all part of how we experience that story. And so, and the processes by which we try to distinguish canon and fandom are part of what you want to study when you study transmedia studies today. So that's a long answer, and I'm not sure it fully addresses it because they were always overlap, confusingly overlapping terms, and I've just through time abandoned the focus on convergence for a focus on transmedia. Wow, okay, so there's, yeah, that was there's so much for us to think about there, um, trans text, trans character, your, your, uh, your, your new work. Um, comics and stuff dropped a, a couple of weeks ago. I'm in the, about three quarters, almost done with it. It is a, it is a, just an incredible book. Why stuff in comics and stuff, Henry? Well, I could tell the story in many different ways. Like everything, it's overdetermined. But I will start with the idea that when we look at a comic, uh, 
we see for the artist I'm interested in a, a, a conspicuous production in the sense that they are drawing lots of details into their panels that matter to them. And we know it matter, they matter to them because it's extra work they're not getting paid for, right? If, they, if you're paid by the page, the most efficient way to do it is draw a talking ad and a simple streamlined background and move to the next page. But these guys are sometimes taking extra days and days to draw these richly detailed panels full of the physical artifacts that surround their characters and often tracking down the exact, the right historical reference point for that. Those details matter. And talking to artists, it's, it's very clear that they're aware that this is hard work, but meaningful work to them. So I got interested in right, why do they matter? How can we take a formal focus on mise-en-scene and connect it with a larger question about material culture? And there is a growing multidisciplinary perspective out there from anthropology, from literary studies, from art history, that's starting to look at material culture, things, objects, stuff. It's described various things by different scholars, but what it's all asking is why are the things we gather around us meaningful? What does it mean to possess our possessions? And this takes on new urgency as we're dealing in a world where we carry more and more stuff with us, where our culture is itself obsessed with deciding what stuff to keep and what to get rid of, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, uh, spark joy, the spark joy movement, or it's a uh, hoarders on reality television, or it's unboxing videos. We're seeing these stories everywhere about stuff. And I think comics right now are one of the venues where those stories are being told in a particularly rich way because of the role that mise-en-scene plays in comics. And finally, I got interested in the fact that while we often in comic studies think about juxtaposition, we've done less as a field, I think, in terms of the mise-en-scene within the frames, the juxtapositions of, between characters and background. And I saw this as a way of beginning a conversation about that, which gets us to the parts of comics that Scott McCloud chose not to write about back in the day. Right. Yeah, no, that's so important to um, to allow us or to kind of readjust our frame of in, um, critical engagement and to really look at what's going on. And like you said, there is a lot of intentionality in what is put within that um, space and that demands actually and demands in a both pleasurable and a kind of challenging way our attention. Um, you've also, gosh, you've written so much um, in, and, uh, in and through comics. Um, and your piece, you know, when you talk about unique voices in comics and uh, Brian Michael Bendis in particular, I was struck by kind of how this might engage with auteur theory and kind of bring that into comics. But maybe you have a completely different idea here. No, I mean, that particular piece on Brian Bendis was for a book uh, Alan McKee edited on beautiful things in popular culture. So the assignment for each of us was to choose some area of popular culture and stake a claim for the best. And my claim for the best was highly qualified in, in the sense that I was describing Bendis as the, the best contemporary mainstream superhero comic writer. And that was part of the point was that we can't say what's the best in comics. We have to be very, very specific with it. But it did lead me to think about what makes an author in comics good. You know, what is, how do we identify an author as an auteur, as your question here frames it. And, you know, I think I, to answer that question, I'd begin with this, making a distinction I make in the book between two different comics art markets in the US today, right? The, the, I demonstrate early on that the, the books that sell through Diamond at comic shops and the books that sell, say, on Amazon have very little overlap with each other. So the Amazon top-selling books tend to be independent, so-called independent comics. They're, they're often drawn and written by the same person. So I don't have a problem identifying those as authored comics. In fact, part of the claim those books are making for cultural quality is that they are authored 
And that sets up the other kind of comics, the, the stuff that's on Diamond's List, the stuff I buy at my specialty shop, uh, Comics Factory in Pasadena is where I go to buy my comics. And that shop is very special to me. And I go there to buy particular kinds of comics. So that's the superhero comics are where this stuff gets interesting because clearly Marvel and DC set long-term goals for the characters, the maps, you know, story, story connections because they're crisscrossing titles. It's done in a large writer's room. So where, how do we find uniqueness in that? It's easy when you're looking at a Frank Miller or Alan Moore who are doing special imprints that are authorized to take that character in a different direction. But Bendis was interesting to me because he was the dominant writer for Marvel at the time that I wrote that piece and yet seemed to have a very distinctive voice. So that takes us back to the auteur theory as it emerges in cinema, right? And those guys were writing about studio product in genres and how a director might assert a dominant personality there that was distinct from the studios they worked with. And some of the early auteurs even talked about a director at war with his material, that the director was seen as an author insofar as they refused to follow the rules a particular genre or broke the, the sort of conventions of that genre in a particular way. And so Bendis stood out as a, 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 a comics writer whose voice, you know, was clearly influenced by David Mamet and a particular kind of dialogue style, who was very known for his final panel shocks and surprises, who had a particular view of these characters that particularly are maybe represented in the spy, you know, the spy, his reinvention of Spider-Man, the few ultimate Spider-Man, but were there in all of his work, both independent and mainstream. And that's the last thing I'd say about Bendis, is he worked both as an independent comics creator and a mainstream creator at that moment in his career. And we could see parallels or connections across them, which made for interesting analysis in that regard. So is every writer for Marvel or DC an author in that sense? I mean, I'm not trying to create a cultural hierarchy here. I'm very critical of cultural hierarchies, but I think we have to weigh this still on a case-by-case -case basis to say there's not room for a lot of rookie writers to stretch the limits of uh, the form that they're working in. Marvel is too dominant a force over many of those writers. And so we're not seeing those distinctive voices or those creative struggles on the page in a lot of cases, but there are plenty of great writers of comics in the mainstream who do demonstrate these traits of being an auteur, the way the auteur theory might have defined it. So interesting and a really great way to um, kind of convey the concepts that you're formulating in and through kind of film history there. Um, gosh, David Mack. Yeah, uh, and you, I know you've written on comics as poetry and kabuki in particular. Comics as poetry, Henry, what do, what do you mean by that? Or what can, where can we go with that? Well, I, I, my interest in Max started not with kabuki, which I love, but started with the work that he was doing in Daredevil, working with Brian Bendis and then working on his own. And the Echo Quest comic had been a notoriously controversial comic among superhero fans because it so broke the flow of Daredevil for a period of time and really went beyond the bounds of difference in terms of what's acceptable as a comic style. Even for Daredevil, which I point out has been a site of experimentation throughout much of its history as being a kind of superhero for Marvel that's well known enough that people care about, but is not their top tier character, so that there's some room for experimentation. And Mac was experimenting with this, and what people were confused with is that the images seemed to halt our flow. They were not things we smoothly read forward with. They were not a classical continuity of comics. And so metaphors, like there's a moment where a character pushes, the, a dying man pushes his hand against another character's face, and that becomes an icon that travels throughout the rest of the book. And so 
there was a focus on the individual building blocks that didn't really sound like prose in the way we traditionally think of comics prose that seemed more poetic in terms of the focus on reading the metaphors and making connections across them across the book and when i actually spoke to david mack i interviewed him san diego comic-con some years back we were it was very clear he thought in that same way that he came out of a kind of avant-garde arts education that he thought even of the work he did for Marvel as an artist book, something that was formally more, the form was more important than the content form that he was looking for, packing as much information into each image as he could, not in a denotative sense, but in a connotative sense. And so the metaphor of poetry met, resonated with him. I ended up publishing that interview and I ended up publishing a piece on his work for Daredevil that tried to think about in what sense was Echo Quest a modernist superhero comic and what does that tell us about how, how much tolerance there is within the genre and its fans for experimentation and difference. Because that clearly fell outside of many fans' tolerance zone, yet I think it's really a magnificent work. And the more time I spend with it, the more I admire it. Yeah, absolutely. And for folks like me who work on Latinx comics, of course, that is a, a kind of epic moment, right? Um, with the Mestiza superhero and the education of her in and through her senses in ways that are absolutely extraordinary. Um, gosh, you've also done um, this work on world building and retro futurisms focusing on uh, Dean Motter's uh, Mr. X. Um, yeah, world building, retro futurism, what, where can we go with this one? Well, I mean, I, I think what interested me about Motter is he had a particular obsession with the 1938-39 World's Fair in New York and the imagery around it of the future, the world of tomorrow. And that runs through Mr. X and Terminal City and the other Electropolis, all of the works that Dean Motter has done. And I was in fact asked to write about Dean Motter for a book on uh, the city and comics and had not really spent a lot of time with him before, but as I dug into it, that's what resonated with me because I also collect artifacts from the 1939 World's Fair I have a variety of things from that. And so that became my point of entry. Uh, and it led me to look, that's part of what led me to write comics and stuff in a way was this collector, using the collector's own obsessions to understand their comics and to dig deeper into their comics. And so that essay has got a prelude that's really about the way the digital has changed our relation to historical materials. And it's informed very much by Will Straw's work on this. Um, and so, you know, retrofuturism then became a, a lens to think about how we build a vision of tomorrow that's actually looking backwards rather than forwards. Frederick Jameson had said about science fiction that it had no future anymore, that it was only looking backwards. And so I didn't want to accept that premise that this was simple nostalgia or collapsing of difference because it struck me for Dean Motter, the iconography was really important that he, as a collector, he cared about the details in that book. And it wasn't the implosion of meaning that Jameson and the other postmodernists talked about. So that's where I started going down. Since then, world building has just become central to the vocabulary by which I think about pretty much all media. I think we're at a moment of time where world building best describes a lot of the films that are out there. You see it if you look at an historical film from say the 1950s and an historical film today, just how dense the details are, how much historical reconstruction goes into a television series like Rome, say, compared to Ben-Hur, just to use two obvious examples that represent the same time and the same material that we're now drawn into these worlds the science fiction worlds we're interested in are detailed in a really dense way a lot of the screen time is spent building these worlds and comics increasingly are also building elaborate worlds that when we read them 
we may remember the world more vividly than remember the characters or the stories. And so comics to me become an interesting way into thinking about what it is to live in a world where a, a moment when the worlds are really what cinema and mini media is about. And as that takes place, then production designers say, become as important as screenwriters and how we think about how Hollywood is telling stories. And the artist becomes really important as they've always been, but particularly important in understanding some of these densely drawn details where we really do care about everything that's crammed into the frame. How do you bring all of this and everything, I guess, into your classroom? Is there a, a Henry Jenkins sort of trademark <laughs> for doing this? Well, I think you see in that picture, uh, PowerPoint's a particularly useful plot tool for doing this because we can bring so many different media together into the same, same presentation. And, may, and it, uh, the images evoke associations at a deeper level than uh, we might otherwise. The image behind me there in that picture is of uh, protest, the, the Occupy protest in New York City where when I happened to be walking by the park where the occupiers were occupying, there was a whole group of people getting off the bus in zombie costumes, inspired by The Walking Dead. Uh, and they were using the zombie as a way, they, as a way of drama dramatizing the lost future of their generation. But they also turned out to be horror fans who had been at a horror fan convention and just came over in cosplay to participate in the protest. So when this particular talk I was giving in Chile, uh, and I went out to the streets after giving this talk, and um, what I ran into were protesters dressed like zombies. It was as if they popped off the screen into the physical space. And I was trying to figure out what they were protesting because I'd heard so much about the zombie imagery traveling to Latin America. Uh, but it turned out they were there promoting the fall release of the new season of Walking Dead. So my thing had gone full circle. But that one image, if I unpack it, contains a great density of information. And so by having, using PowerPoint as much as I do in my teaching and using juxtapositions in PowerPoint, there's really a depth to the slides that if someone wants me to unpack anything there, we can keep drilling down and drilling down and drilling down until we understand it at a deeper level. And so teaching through juxtaposition is a really helpful thing to do. But I do teach comics and I do teach uh, transmedia at USC. And part, of, I, I don't know that I, I don't, I'm still not very good at teaching comics. It's a hard medium to teach, particularly because of the need to constantly scan images and put them up and, so forth. But transmedia, we teach through practice that the final assignment is to pitch a, a transmedia approach to an existing work of fiction. Uh, and I bring in, um, bring in folks who receive pitches here in LA from both the old and new media entertainment section to be a panel of judges. So my students are actually pitching to people who in their day jobs hear pitches and give them a reality check on it. And that gets them thinking about the theoretical side of transmedia at a much deeper level. Wow, I do that too, but I, mine is a pretend panel of, and it's me. Uh, ah. <laughs> but, I, but that is um, extraordinary for your students. What a great opportunity. Of course, um, PowerPoints and juxtapositions and your kind of access because of your consulting work um, with um, in, in cinema, there's blogs and there's your, uh, there's the Innovation Lab at USC. And of course, there's your famous podcast, How Do You Like It So Far? Learning by other means, um, I'm, I'm supposing. Yeah, I'm deeply committed to the idea that we should do our scholarship in the most public facing ways that we can. You know, it grows out of the MIT spirit that I, you know, I was in MIT for 20 years, but I felt like during that period that media change was taking place everywhere, and yet academics had abdicated the role they might play in 
engaging in conversation with other people. We weren't speaking and we weren't listening to the other folks, whether they were artists or activists or educators or industry leaders who were undergoing those same media change. And so coming out of that, I have a deep commitment to make my ideas public. And the blog and the podcast are very much part of it. The policy white papers I've done are ways of translating that information and the things that people could work on. I even at USC teach a course on basically how to be a public intellectual, where I teach my students how to blog and I showcase their work on my blog. I teach them how to do interviews, both to ask questions and to respond to questions about their work. I, I'm teaching them how to do op-ed pieces, uh, policy reports, all of the things that are not journal articles and books because I want them to have access to those skills. They won't all do it. They won't do all of it, but they should know that they can do it and why it matters to do it uh, as they go out into their professions. And that's a course I'm really passionate about and really deeply committed to. Where was that course when I was an undergraduate? <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know that you can teach it as an undergraduate because I think what I find is you need to have your own voice and you need to have your own research before you can effectively do the activities. So I discourage even our master's students from doing it, but the PhDs are coming into their own and this helps them think about their career in that way. Uh, but yeah, I, I would focus undergraduates at a different set of skills. And in some ways, the team project and transmedia is also about translating academic theory into practical knowledge that can be communicated effectively when you go out into the world and may work in the media industries. Mm -hmm. I still want people to be thinking theoretically, politically about the work that they're doing because I think it empowers them to take creative risk and bring in new voices and be agents of change wherever they, they land. Um, so this is, you know, we talked about this in the fall in my uh, film and comics course um, when Martin Scorsese, you know, wrote this, um, I guess, infamous maybe statement about Marvel movies not being cinema. How did you react, Henry, when you read this or heard this? With great disappointment because Scorsese is a director whose work I admire and who I think has has deep knowledge of the history of cinema as a particularly passionate cineast of the films of the 1950s, the so called the auteurist films, but the later auteurist films. So he's interested in the Bud Butterker Westerns and the Sam Fuller film noirs and Anthony Mann and those directors, who I also am passionate about. So I was troubled by this. To some degree, it was a cynical move by someone who was working with Netflix and wanted to be an e eligible for an Oscar. That is, Netflix has had such troubled relationship with the Academy that I think uh, claim, laying claim to being a protector of cinema at a point that you're being accused of destroying cinema is a really interesting strategic move. And reframing the lack of access Netflix has to the screen for, with uh, the idea that they were shut out of the screen by these superhero mega pictures uh, is also very cynical in my point of view, because if you looked in LA, the time that Irishman played here, there was not a single superhero film playing in any cinema in the entire city of Los Angeles during the time the Irishman was playing there. So he was simply misleading us about the impact of this. But beyond that, I think there was an attack on these films as A, lacking human elements. And I think the, the people, I counted the other day 500,000 fan fiction stories about Marvel Universe on our archive of our own. I think they would differ with the idea that there were no characters and no emotional resonance to those characters, that their unpacking of those characters was really central to their experience of that film. And the description of it as an amusement park attraction rather than as a film rose out of the anxiety about transmedia, uh, about multi-sensory entertainment, as if that was somehow not what cinema was, when I think we could have, we could hard find a moment in history of cinema that that wasn't part of the dynamics of what cinema could and would be. So I think it, it's, it's 
I'm very skeptical of each and every part of that analysis. I don't think it does justice to what's interesting about Marvel. It shows he doesn't really understand contemporary cinema and the ways that these Marvel stories build up information about the characters over time. The accruing of character details means that an action moment can rather efficiently raise emotional stakes for those characters in ways that the informed audience knows about. Whereas Scorsese said, I've seen a few of them. Well, you can't understand the Marvel Cinematic Universe by seeing a few of the titles because it's an interlocking system. The system as a whole is where the story lies more than within the individual film. So I think he just doesn't know how to read a superhero movie at the most fundamental level. It's not a genre that matters to him. But it's frustrating that someone who rescued so many obscure Westerns, say, in the 1950s, at a point that a quarter of American movies were Westerns, is suddenly attacking this new genre, which may be dominating at the current moment, but in its own way allows as much room for expression and experimentation, innovation, as the films that he cares about. And I think in the future, people will be looking at Ryan Coogler's uh, Black Panther films, say, uh, as an example of a rich combination of genre and author that spoke within a studio structure as profoundly as Anthony Mann's Westerns did to a previous generation. Wow, yeah, absolutely. I'm completely on, on your side. I'm, I'm with you on this completely. Um, and the interlocking stories, absolutely. If, if you are kind of stepping in a little toe into the MCU, uh, nah, it doesn't, it's not gonna work. Um, but actually this leads nicely to uh, really my final kind of question here, which is where, where is the vitality in comics and comic studies today from your side of the table, Henry? Well, I think we've built some basic theoretical tools as a field, and I think the canon is solidifying too quickly for my taste. So that I think one of the spaces of vitality is precisely expanding which comics we write about and expanding outward even more the theoretical language we use to talk, talk about comics. I mean, there are certain moves that are well, well preserved and well developed, but I think there's room for more stuff. And that's where my intervention was was in comics and stuff, trying to lay out a, a new set of questions to ask about comics, a new set of context to place comics into, and to write about artists and writers who are well known among comic scholars, but have not necessarily gotten a lot of treatment. They're sort of at the fringe of the canon. So I was trying not to go dig people out totally obscure, but to, because I needed to demonstrate the method on something people were familiar with, but I wanted to nudge the boundaries of the, the canon in such a way that we brought in more artists. Uh, and I think particularly young female artists, younger artists, artists of color are really important to include in that at the current time. And I think we're also seeing some great books. Uh, here's uh, Rebecca Wanzo's book, which I'm a huge fan of, uh, The Content of Our Caricature, which does all of the things I just said. She digs into something we think we know well already, racial character. She expands outward the canon of what we're talking about to include artists from all different parts of comics history and to really dig into it in a deeper way. And she's writing it in a very accessible way that can engage students and non-academics. And I think that's another sign that these two books came less than a month apart from the same publisher is another sign that the field is growing and that we have the space to grow. The other thing is I'm discovering is the price of color illustrations has shifted. So we were able to have more than a hundred color illustrations in comics and stuff. And that makes it possible to do kinds of analysis of comics that we couldn't do before. Where I'd like to see comics go is more digital tools for studying comics. Um, I think I wrote in the book about Altcult and his stuff. And Altcult's an artist who's been badly served by shrunken editions that don't represent the full scale of his work. And we're finally getting from Sunday Press and these other publishers, these large scale versions of early comics. 
but then we want to write about them, we've reduced them down to small size again, and we're shrinking them rather than expanding. Them. And I would love to see digital tools that allow us to hover over the comics and annotate the comics in ways that bring to the surface the details rather than shrinking them. And that was comics and stuff, frankly, started as a digital book, and I just couldn't get there with the access to technology and talent that I had. I couldn't, it was gonna to be too slow and too frustrating to do what I wanted to do with it. But I hope the next generation of comic scholars push in those directions because then the kinds of analysis we can do just blow up in really interesting ways. Absolutely, and um, in any case with comics and stuff, you're right, um, having the color reproductions and in some instances like the Brian Talbot stuff, full pages, really makes a difference. It does um, in, in someone like myself reading and then following your breakdown of what's happening. Um, gosh, we've gone from, you know, childhood superhero undocumented sort of analogies through kind of interlocking stories, world building, comics and stuff, tr transmedia, convergence, comics. Gosh, Thank you, Henry. My pleasure. It's been a lot of fun uh, pontificating at you today and less thinking through the questions you posed.